Hello and welcome back to Powerless. Last week, we had a couple's meet cute again from Kai's point of view. After getting robbed by Payton, Kai got in a different fight with someone else. A quote unquote silencer showed up and blocked Kai's power, so Payton had to save him. After Payton saved Kai from the silencer, they bantered slash flirted for a hot minute, and she convinced him that she actually does have powers. It turned out that Payton and Kai were both put into the purging trials, a death game so unimportant that neither character really cared and we got no details about it until now. We met some exciting side characters like Human Golden Retriever Jax and Blair with the lilac hair. Payton was picked up to go to the trials conveniently immediately after she learned that she was in them, and we met two other competitors, only one of which matters. All right, let's fly through Kai's chapter here. It's probably mostly just gonna be simping after her anyway, so we're, we're having dinner. So the king and queen come in, and while they're described as wearing jewels, the king is also wearing a suit, a fine suit, which I can only imagine means like a modern suit because I don't think this author knows or cares about any kind of historical costuming. Like, I'll take anything. I don't need it to be all in, like, one specific time period or anything. These are fantasy times. You can you can mess with it a little bit. But, like, just fully a modern suit. I, I cannot help but feel like this author was raised on, like, Disney Descendants or something like that. A very cheesy, very tween, very modern. What about... Peacock feathers. Yeah, I bet you nobody's gonna have those at Cotillion. And that, that's their way into fantasy is through that, um, which is unfortunate. Again, the trials also meant nothing to Kai before now. He never really felt like he thought about them in passing as like a thing that would eventually happen, but he thought about it with all of the passion of someone who's thinking about what they're gonna have for lunch. So when the king says, like, it's a big honor and you're representing your kingdom and Kai's like, these words have been drilled into me since childhood, I'm like, I don't fucking believe you. Oh, we get some food, we get some food. Seasoned turkey. Okay, they have turkeys. Heaps of beans. What kind of beans? We don't know, but there's heaps of them. Heaps of beans are being shoveled onto plates. If I have two beans and then I add two more beans, what do I have? Some beans. Sticky buns. Sticky buns have made a comeback. Um, that's it. I'll, I'll let you know if we get anything besides turkey, so many beans, and more sticky buns. It's an interesting thing, food in stories. I'm, I'm immediately becoming distracted even though I said I wasn't going to try to. I love describing food in stories. And you might think, well, Jolene, you must be a foodie in real life. But no, you've seen me. When left to my own devices, I eat brown cafeteria food exclusively. But I love describing food in books. So like, you don't have to be like obsessed with food to want to describe it well in your stories. And yes, what the characters are eating can help with world building. I hate it any time that authors say, oh, I don't care about this or that, that's not important. It's fine if you don't care about it, you don't have to include it in your book, but like dismissing something offhand as like not important in a story is a disservice to writing, in my opinion, because food is a great way to world build, at the very least, if not showing what's important to characters, their tastes, and just, so many things can be done with food alone. Not to mention, I kind of just take pride in making my readers a little bit hungry. Like, I like that ability. So yeah, don't, don't dismiss things like describing characters or describing food or describing clothing. Don't dismiss those things offhand as like unimportant and not things that help the story because they 100% are. Oh no, he's, he's trying to control what she eats. Oh, I hate this man. I hate him so much. So he sees that Peyton is not eating and he decides, well, it won't do for her to be hungry. So he takes a piece of turkey, again, because so far we have turkey beans and sticky buns, what a meal, off of his plate and like plops it onto her plate to be like, here, you eat this. And like, that is one of my pet peeves. Like, don't fucking try to control what somebody else eats. Do you like beans? I ask casually, as I can only assume because there's only three things on this table. Turkey, mountains of beans, and sticky buns. 
Ooh, potatoes, we have potatoes. They have turkey, potatoes, so many beans, and sticky buns here. So basically like American Thanksgiving dinner with like a uh, emphasis on the beans. He's also threatening to spoon feed her, which again, I think is supposed to be cute, but his coming off is really fucking controlling and creepy. And I am like, every bit of this is making me so angry. Don't worry though, his like nagging her has convinced her to eat some beans. Let's try again, shall we? I have two beans, then I add two more beans. What does that make? A very small casserole. Eat your beans or you can't have any dessert. I'm sure the dessert is just sticky buns again. The king is like, oh, hey, that's right. My son was saved the other day. I don't know why uh, Kai told his dad this or anybody told his dad this. Like, I feel like this king is not very tuned in to what his people are saying. So Kai could have just not mentioned it and the king would never know. The king's like, oh, hey, this is the girl that saved you. This is just an excuse for Kai and Peyton to snipe back and forth with what I imagine is supposed to be like sexual tension, but is in fact just annoying. He tries to like jab at her. I know how much you love silvers, which took me a while to understand because I think this is the first time we've, he means money, but I think we've only referred to it as shillings and I think coppers at this point. And now he's calling them silvers. And I'm just, will you make up your mind what your money is called? So, okay, I guess there's no dessert. Uh, this is a one course meal consisting of turkey, beans, some mashed potatoes and sticky buns. And now it's over and everybody's just supposed to go back to their rooms. What lavish feasts we have here. He decides, again, just being fully pushy, that he's gonna escort Peyton back to her room instead of her personal cop. His room is across from hers? Oh, uh, we have another um, moment just straight out of the romance handbook where he grabs her chin and tips her head up. And I'm sure the girlies are squealing. I guess. If I was the girlies, I'd be really bored of this stuff by now because it's the same thing over and over again, but maybe maybe we're not bored of it yet. Maybe we're still like, this is what we like. I don't know. I, I Alas, I'm not one of the girlies. Some days I wish I was. Oh, and now she is holding a dagger to his throat. We've got two for the price of one. So we have the head tilt up and the dagger to the throat. He thinks of her, I think not for the first time, as a vicious little thing. I just don't know why that is like hot to so many people. He's calling her little, he's calling her a thing. Like that's not hot to be called a vicious little thing. That's like something you say to like a small animal that's like trying to defend itself from you. Oh, you're a vicious little thing. Like that's not praise. It's gross. I, everything about this man is gross. Please throw the whole man away and start over. More grossness, it's just all gross. So she has a, a cut on her lip from where a cop punched her and he realizes that it happened and he thinks about finding that person and cutting their hands off. Sir, you murder people in the street, but somebody, some law enforcement official who is one of your guys punched a criminal, but because you think that criminal is hot, you're gonna go chop this guy's hands off. I would say make it make sense, but it's never gonna make sense because he's just, just that guy. He's the archetype. He's the, I mean, he's a copy paste love interest. I already have it written down. Also, there's no one around to witness the fact that she's still standing there holding a knife to the prince's throat. So like she could, she could just kill him and like no one would do anything they might eventually wander into this hallway and notice him dead on the floor. Like, what is this castle? He noticed the dagger stuck down the back of her pants and not because it would be so obvious in her tight black leggings, but because he saw like a, a hint of it glinting in the light when she turned her back to him. And when in fact, it would just be like the outline of a dagger uh, above her ass. Yep, so that's it. Like they just have, the, that chapter exists to be that sexy moment where they hold daggers to each other's throats and say cliche lines. What even, what's the point? I mean, yes, we have to get this completely predictable romance going somewhere. But all right, I need to stop and get ready to chat with my client, super exciting. And I'll probably be back to film some more later today. So you'll see me in this outfit more. Bye. Hi, hello. One more chapter of this, I think, and then I've been very busy today, and I am gonna just go play video games after this. 
it's a pretty short chapter, so maybe I'll do two. We'll see. We'll see how much this chapter makes me go insane. If I was to guess whether Payton was a fairly physically fit person, judging from what we've seen of her so far, I would say yes. But she assures us that actually living on the street has made her frail and weak and the training is kicking her ass. Wish that that would have been demonstrated at any point before now. Also, she is wearing a tank top. I think that's basically the only thing she's worn other than that blouse. By the way, what is the training? Um, we don't know, it's just tiring. Ah, we find out what she's just been doing, and that is punching a tree. What excellent training. I love, I honestly, I love to see what all of these girlies think that, like, physical training is. Um, and it's always so absurd. Things like hanging from your arms until they dislocate, punching a tree that has padding tied to it. All of the just constant obstacle courses in the Dragon Book, even though obstacle courses really do not prepare those people for what they're actually be doing. Like, just the stuff that they come up with. This author loves the word residing. It is her main go-to word when she needs to say that something is somewhere. So, for example, where most of my competition is currently residing. None of your competition is residing in the practice yard. They do not live here. Where most of your competition is currently located. Why not that? That works fine. Where most of my competition is currently practicing. Where most of my competition is currently resting. Like, why residing? Why? Yeah, we're just doing Hunger Games. We're just doing Hunger Games, but but shit. This is Walmart Hunger Games. This is Timu Hunger Games right here. So she's thinking about the interviews that are coming up where they have to impress the people so that they can get sponsors. It's just Hunger Games. This is the Hunger Games we have at home. This is the Hunger Games that your grandmother accidentally buys at the grocery store thinking that it's the real Hunger Games. Kai is of course here, and of course he's not wearing a shirt. So you managed to get your shirt off. Suddenly feeling the urge to hit something again, I spin and land a solid kick into the thick pads, remember the tree is padded, resounding in a satisfying thunk. I think you mean resulting in a satisfying thunk. She said she's stripped down to her thin tank. She never calls it a tank top, she just calls it a tank. But like, what was she wearing before? We've never seen her wear anything like over her tank top. So what did she strip down from? Apparently shorts do not exist in this world though, because she's still wearing long pants and she's just rolled them up as much as possible. Can we get this girl some capris? Jorts, maybe? Yeah, why don't they have punching bags in this world? They have toilets. They have random other things. Why Why not just say that they have punching bags? Why has she got to hit a tree with like a mattress tied to it? Of course, she's really good at throwing knives and using daggers because the girlies in these books, I don't know who wrote the rule, but it's a rule that they can't use anything except daggers, knives, and occasionally bows. I think we can blame Katniss for the bows thing. Whenever I point this out, somebody inevitably gets mad at me, saying, well, women can't handle swords. So first of all, please do the bare minimum amount of research about weapons that women would historically use, swords are included, as well as long weapons like naganadas. There's a lot of historical precedent for women being able to use things besides daggers and bows. Also, I often have people saying in a far less aggressive way, oops, my female characters also only use daggers and bows, and I made it make sense in my universe, and it's like, that's great, but I want you to sit back and really think about why you have limited your female lead to only daggers and bows. Is it because that really does make sense with the world that you've built, or is it because it's just easier to picture the action scenes with daggers and bows because we already have so many movies and books that only let the female characters use daggers and bows? Maybe think about the just sheer number of awesome, cool, badass weaponry that you could use in your fantasy book. Like, go on a little bit of a Google spree and have fun checking out what kind of weapons your female lead character could wield, and maybe consider stop limiting yourself to daggers and bows. They can still use the daggers and the bows, just like maybe allow them to use some other things as well. Consider a lot of factors when choosing a weapon for your main character, such as their background, the culture, and what they would need to survive. Wouldn't it be way cooler if Payton, rather than just being super good at fighting with a dagger for some reason, 
As a thief in a city, what if instead she used like a combination of bolos and a strangling wire if she ever got in trouble? Small, easy to carry, quick to use, or perhaps even a slingshot. Something like that that could be different but would make sense with her as a thief in the city. I mean, yeah, could a dagger also make sense? Sure, but as a small, tiny woman, as we keep being reminded she is, she wouldn't want to get that close to another person, especially a larger man. She wouldn't want to get physically that close to him to stab him with the dagger because he could physically overpower her, so it would make more sense if she had options for long distance and short range. And of course, all of these characters also happen to be super good at throwing the daggers, but those are actually two different skills, stabbing and throwing, two different skills. Anyway, these writers don't care, but... Please, I beg you, care. Care in your own books when you're writing your badass female leads and let them do something interesting with the weapons. Pause and think about their world for a little while and think about like what weapons besides a dagger and a bow might they also use. But she's throwing her, her daggers at a target and Kai throws one and like it almost hits her in the head. And she decides that now's the time to have a little pissy fit at him. And she like stomps over him and be like, what was the meaning of that? She, I don't know where this uppityness came from. Maybe she gets uppity when she's tired. For some reason, I guess because the author decides that we need some kind of rivalry or bitchy girl going on, but we, we might be headed toward unhinged bullies. This might be uh, walking us down that path rather quickly. Blair also throws a dagger and she clips, intentionally clips our hero's ear. Why? No fucking clue. But that happened and the main character is like, <gasps> Blair, she cut me intentionally. Apparently Blair managing to cut her was like a display of how powerful these elites are compared to her. And I'm like, okay, sure. I am I remain deeply unconvinced because we've already seen what a total badass she is because conveniently her father taught her how to be like a warrior princess. Kai is of course being like super protective and like flirty uh, because why wouldn't he be? And she goes to like touch her hair and he grabs her wrist and is like, no, you'll get blood in your hair. And she's like, why are you being such a gentleman? And I'm like, this is what you think gentleman behavior is? Grabbing you? They sass back and forth, and for some reason this time, she thinks I'm playing a dangerous game. You held a dagger to his throat last night, and you didn't think that that was, like, dangerous. But now you're just sniping back and forth in a flirty way, and you're like, oh, he's so dangerous. He decides that he's gonna braid her hair. This girl has no bodily autonomy. Um, so he just starts braiding her hair. I hate him. I fucking hate him. Don't fucking touch someone's hair without their permission? What are you doing? And also though, also though, why was she working out with her long hair just like fully down? I know that there are some people who do it and those people confuse the fuck out of me. Why wouldn't you put it in a ponytail to work out? We keep mentioning that he has calluses on his hands. And that's the end of the chapter. They just snipe back and forth a little bit. They're all obviously very attracted to each other. He demonstrates that she has no bodily autonomy, the end. Um, the next chapter is kind of long-ish, so I am going to be done for today. Next time you see me, I will probably be wearing a different outfit. Welcome back, welcome back to Julian's House of Bad Decisions. We are gonna read some more of this. Oh, dearie, dear, dearie, dear, dear, dear. Dearie, dearie, dear. <laughs> not even that far. We are pretty far for having not started these games yet, though, or these trials. What do you think the trials are gonna be like? Comment below and let me know. I have not, I have no idea. I've spoiled myself 0% for this book, except for that somebody said it was like Light Lark. That's it. That's the extent of what I know about this book. So all of my reactions are 100% just like real in the moment. So do we think the trials are just going to be a blatant Hunger Games knockoff? Like they're gonna be exactly like the Hunger Games? Or do you think we will get a little bit more of the ever popular American Ninja Warrior style things that were especially very prevalent in Fourth Wing, where there's just obstacle course, so many obstacle courses. <laughs> How many obstacle courses can we have? All of them. What do you think? Or do you think that there's gonna be something else? Is, it, is the trials gonna be something else? Is it gonna be a series of quizzes? That would be hilarious if it was just a series of quizzes and then anybody who got it wrong just gets killed.
That would be great. Uh, are we gonna have more like um, Jennifer Ressi and her Savior's Champion uh, trials, where there was a lot of variety. I will say one thing for the Savior's Champion. There was a lot of variety in the trials. It wasn't just all obstacle courses. Some of it was very dumb. Pig challenge, I'm looking at you. But there was at least variety. All right, we're back with Payton, oh joy. Uh, but I'd rather, honestly, I'd rather be with Payton than with Kai because Kai is a despicable, disgusting human being and I don't understand why anybody would like him. Like, girlies, are you okay? Like, I get liking the bad boy, but he's a Nazi. Like, maybe examine your taste in fictional men. <laughs> All right, we are prepping for the interview. Once again, just straight out of Hunger Games. Why are they doing this interview? Is there TV in this world? Is she just gonna be up in front of a bunch of people in some kind of theater setting? Like what, what on earth does this interview serve? Especially since she is just like a lowly grunt who's like literally just there to be death fodder. Why does she need an interview? Like why any of this? Also, we have really jumped the gun with the whole like Hunger Games, seeing Katniss as the Mockingjay. They have dubbed uh, Payden as the Silver Savior for like saving the prince, which is the dumbest nickname. And if I was her, I would be cringing. Not because people are calling me like a nickname, but that nickname is terrible. And it's only because she has special girl hair. Uh, but it feels like we're trying to get like Mockingjay levels of meaningfulness when it doesn't mean anything. I wonder if, Kai will ever internalize the fact that he has no powers unless he steals them from other people. Without other people, he is also just a normie, complete normie with no powers at all, the very people that he kills. It would be amazing if he would like realize that about himself and like make some revelations. I doubt he will, but maybe hope springs eternal, you know? Get used to disappointment. Oh, she's finally wearing a dress. It is, of course, a very modern dress. It's sleeveless, sleeveless and light blue. Elegant, but not too flashy, whatever that means. I don't know what that means in this world because the clothing in this world is just so anachronistic. Again, we're keeping the characters too separated from the trials for the trials to feel like anything because they're they're going to the bowl which is the stadium i i swear i really want to like get together with this author and be like let me name some things for you please like i mean literal names can be okay if there's a reason for them in a sci-fi book that i eventually hope to publish the alien race that captures the main characters are extremely literal that's like on the page fact about them they're somewhat Vulcan-esque in their attitudes, and because of their just extreme literalness, they name everything what it is. Like, most of their spaceships are just named the ship. It can, it can get a little confusing sometimes. Like, they are so literal like that. And that's, like, an intentional part of the story instead of just lazy naming. But anyway, I'm sorry, I got distracted. She was going to the bowl and she's like, I've never been there because I've never watched the interviews of the trials before. And like, again, we are finding every reason to keep her completely separated from previous trials, which makes them mean nothing. Whereas Katniss, the Hunger Games were an ever present, terrifying, looming part of her life and she was forced to watch them. So like it felt much more integrated. And yes, I'm gonna keep using Hunger Games as a example of that done well because this book obviously is taking a lot of cues from Hunger Games. Everybody is once again dressed in seemingly in business casual. All the boys are just wearing black pants and button down shirts, which makes me just like picture a bunch of people, okay, we're going on another tangent because I'm just not enjoying this book at all. So I used to be a 4-H kid, surprising none of you. And I used to show animals, goats specifically in my case, but I was around a lot of other kids showing cows, showing pigs, showing sheep, horses, whatever. And the usual attire for most of that was black pants and a button down shirt. So I'm just picturing all of these these guys looking like they're about to take a sheep into the ring to try to win a blue ribbon. Oh, Blair is on page. Blair is on page. And if you are wondering if we get a description of her hair color, of course we do. Of course we do. It's lilac. 
she's being, oh, just the worst, just the worst, because she's flirting with Kai and Kit. And everybody knows that women are always just trying to sleep their way to the top, or always just trying to flirt with the boys. Like, that's how you can tell that she's a bad person. Women who, like, put themselves out there and make it clear that they're interested in guys are the bad ones. We should all be like the main character who's just stumble into a hot guy through no effort of her own and he instantly loves her. That's how relationships should work. So suddenly our main character who has been just flawlessly like playing a part, putting on a mask, tricking everybody in the town because she's a thief and she goes in disguise and she has all of these acts that she plays, but now she's like talking with Kit and like all of a sudden she's so awkward she just can't like hide who she is anymore for some reason and like something lands on her head and she flinches and, and uh, Kit notices and she's like I'm not playing the part very well and I'm like why not? What is it about this time that's making you not play the part well? You've managed to play a role often in front of guards who want to beat you so you, you she, she should be used to playing this part when she feels in danger. Uh, I, I'm curious if this author is going to have her suddenly turn into Katniss, who, like, one of Katniss's biggest flaws is that she can't dissemble. Katniss cannot pretend to be anything else than she is, and that's one of the things we love about her, and one of the ways that she gets into a lot of trouble. But we have seen that this character is not like that. We have seen it on the page, proven multiple times that that's not how she rolls. Yeah, Kit mentions her saving his brother and how people are gonna like her because of that, and it's just giving wannabe Mockingjay vibes all over the place. Well, at least this author knows that the seating in an arena is usually not called pews, but in fact, benches. Still coming for Jenna Moresi and her obsession with pews for some reason. So they get into the arena and she notices that there's like a barrier between themselves and the people viewing, which at first she's like, it's glass, but then she realizes that it is mute, that mystery substance that negates powers so that nobody down in the arena can shoot powers out and nobody watching the arena can shoot powers in. We have a brief nod to divergent when she has to jump down a hole to get to the pit. Not use a ladder, just jump, jump in a hole. She can't, she, it's too dark, she can't see the bottom, so she just has to jump, which she does, um, without really thinking about it. She's just like, huh, and she just jumps in. Of course, Kai went first, and when she lands, he catches her in his strong arms, and I think he should catch everyone in his strong arms. Like, he should move her out of the way, and whoever's next, whoever it is, they get the same treatment. Okay, this, this is a pet peeve of mine. I don't like the line, conversation comes to a halt. I would say conversation comes to an end. Personally, again, pet peeve, not the end of the world if you use that, but like halt implies to me like actual movement. For some reason we're learning about a character called Andy who I don't care about because they're probably just gonna die or at least not be an important character but for some reason we need to know that she is a cousin of Kit and Kai. So I figured out why it's so that she won't be a romantic rival for Kit and Kai um, because these authors cannot conceive that women might exist who do not find their male leads attractive. The male lead must be wanted by all women except the women who physically cannot want them because they are related or because those women are gay. And as we already established, there's no gays here. So we had to make this girl related to them so that we understand why she doesn't go for them. Because like I said, the author cannot conceive that a woman would just not be attracted to Kit or Kai. How and why would that ever possibly happen? Oh God, that's unfortunate. That is unfortunate. So Andy's abilities, um, her superpower is called being a handy. A handy. Oh, I'm so sorry that your author did this to you, um, but apparently handies can fix things, like repair things, like handy as in like useful at repairing objects. 
So confusingly, this doesn't turn out to be her actual power. She has a different power. So I don't remember why she brings up Handies, which is, it was capitalized. I remember that. So it is definitely the name for somebody's power. So that, that terrible name still exists. But she is not one. So maybe she was talking about like her father or something like that in the moment. I'm not going to go get the book and reread that section because that would cause me more psychic damage. I never want to look at the pages of that book ever, ever again. But uh, yeah, it was confusing. And it didn't only confuse me because I did watch Reads with Rachel's video and it confused her too. So yeah, I think perhaps that might be the author doing a bad job versus me not paying good enough attention as a reader. She keeps thinking of Kit as the future king. And I think it's to try and make us like distrust him or not like him because he seems like a really lovely person and I suspect that he'll, he will turn out not to be but I'm like why doesn't she like Kit? Um, he has as far as we know not murdered anyone in the street. Uh, he has not been going around hunting people at his father's behest so like she just makes a lot of assumptions about him that he's going to be exactly the same king as his dad was that he must be uh, just as ruthless and it's like why? He is, in fact, a different person, and if you were smart, you would try to ingratiate yourself to him so that later you could be like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be like your dad and kill innocent people. So the only way down into the like room that they were waiting in, this little waiting room where there was some food and some couches and stuff, is through the trap door. There is no ladder. So to get back out, the hot boys have to boost her out. What is the point of it? Aside from the fact that we need more excuses to get hot guy hands on her, why on earth would you not at least have a ladder to this, like, holding area? Well, at least the main character did something that made sense with what we've seen before. So she decides not to have hot guy hands on her, and she's gonna jump and pull herself up. And because we have seen her, like, scaling buildings and doing this on the regular, this isn't weird that she can just, like, just pull herself up through this trapdoor. Well, okay, I say that, but of course she's in a dress this time, so she's having trouble. I thought that we were just gonna have this moment and she'd be like, hi, I can do it myself, see? But no. Oh my God, it's the female equivalent of getting your shirt ripped off in a fight. Uh, Kai is like, here, let me help you. And he rips her dress up the side, like perfectly making a slit so that she can get her leg up over. So we do have, we do indeed have the dress with the slit up the side. How long is this fucking chapter? And this chapter also feels extremely pointless. Like, did we need this entire sequence? We have, I stand to my feet again. A phrase I am quickly coming to loathe. Ah, uh, we have the the lucky flickerman of this world who says, Welcome to the six ever purging trials, which is just the most Hunger Games thing ever. But it's a it's a woman, not a man. So it's different, legally distinct. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 74th annual Hunger Games! Her name is Tila, and she has teal hair. And the main character's like, that's ironic. And I'm like, or she was born with teal hair and her parents were unimaginative. Now we're just doing, we're literally just doing the interview scene from The Hunger Games. I'll let you know if anything interesting happens. She's interviewing Jax first. Remember, Jax is our resident too good for the sinful world too pure. And he is a teleporter, which reminds me of a, a conversation I had with a, with a client of mine about how Teleporting abilities are one of the hardest abilities to work around in your book because a character who can teleport is really, really kind of OP. And we keep having characters in these books who can teleport and then you spend most of your time as the author trying to figure out reasons why they don't instead of giving them opportunities to use their powers. And that's one of the things that I like to caution people about if you're writing a book where characters have powers or magic or whatever. If you find yourself spending more of your time justifying why your characters are not using their powers, then maybe those aren't the right powers for your book. We are really hitting the fact that this character Ace, this side character named Ace, is pompous. Um, the author will not stop telling us that. Every single thing that this guy does, the main character has to be like, he does this in a pompous way, he does this in a stuck up way, and it's just like, okay, we get it. We, we understand. Okay, now how does that work? Sadie comes up and she's a cloner 
so she can make copies of herself. And it says that she has some of her copies walking through the stands. But we were specifically told that there's a magical barrier between the contestants and the people in the stands so that there can be no magical interference between them. So how is Sadie getting her like doubles to be up in the stands? Aren't they magical? Or maybe they're not magical. Is Sadie creating actual like real copies of herself that are not magical? So many questions, never gonna be answered. What are the rules? Oh Christ, I'm singing again. Oh, we got a shapeshifter here, got an anamorph, uh, Andy, Andy the Handy. I thought her power was to fix things, but apparently also uh, she turns into animals. So for some reason, our main character is going last. Like out of universe, we know it's because she's the main character and the main character should be saved for last, for ultimate tension, but in world, in universe, why is she being saved for last? And uh, Kai demonstrates his powers and he's charming and blah, 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 blah. And now it's her turn, but that's for the next chapter. So this chapter I feel like could have been trimmed a lot. There's a lot happening in this chapter that I don't think we need. They did not need to go down into that little holding area that was like down underground and could only be reached by jumping into a hole and then jumping back out again cut that entirely. The walk to the arena was probably fine. She interacted with Kit a little bit. We got to know him and her opinions of him a little bit more, even though we don't understand her opinions of him. And now we're like, we've got the interviews because the Hunger Games did it. And so we have to do it too, whether it makes sense or not. I'm gonna go probably put my lunch in the oven and try to do at least one more chapter today. See you then. All right, I have the time limit of how long it takes my lunch to cook, so I will hopefully, oh, this is a nice short chapter. I'll have this read, even if I go off on a million tangents before my food is done. So we're with Peyton, and it's gonna be her interview it gets its own chapter. Could have been part of the previous chapter, honestly, if we had cut out that bit about that weird underground holding area. We have another moment where she thinks about how much Kit looks like the king. She will not stop reminding us of that. I'm really not 100% sure what the author is doing with it, except for to give us a reason that we might be suspicious of Kit. But like, she just keeps bringing it up. This author definitely does not trust her reader to pick up what she's putting down. So we get a bunch of information that we already knew about her, like what she's saying her abilities are and what they can do. And then the interviewer is like, tell us about your life. And so she's gonna launch into a diatribe about how it sucks living in the slums. I'm not really sure what we're doing with her character at this point. It seemed like we were going with the sort of, I'm awkward in front of crowds character archetype that we've seen many times, but uh, even though she sat down feeling that way, now she seems to be doing fine, and now she's already getting like really rebellious and being like, the slums are terrible. So I'm kind of confused about where we're going with her. Do you though? So all of a sudden, apparently she has a political agenda that she never mentioned having a single time before now. Then something like pity gleams in her brown eyes. I hate it. I don't want the crowd's pity. I want change. Since when you have never once mentioned that maybe you could get some change enacted in here if you play your cards right. Like this is the first time we have seen you have any notion of like trying to further some kind of agenda. I think the author is really struggling with the character's motivation and goals. And I mean, it is, it is really challenging when you have a character who is thrown into a situation in which they are powerless. Sometimes those situations can be the most fun, but the character still has to have some kind of goals that they are personally striving for. And Peyton doesn't have anything. She has nothing. She's just kind of vibing along. And so when she says something like, oh, she's suddenly always had these convictions about the slums, we're like, well, where did that come from? Why did she decide to, to suddenly bring this up and suddenly want to enact change. As authors, we need to remember that even when our character is in a situation where they are mostly powerless, they would still have their own goals, their own thoughts, their own things that they are working towards and keep those always in mind. Because even though Katniss was very powerless within the arena, she still had, I want to survive. I want to not die, I want to survive. And not because she wanted any glory or anything like that. It's just like, this is what I'm doing. And even though I hate it, I'm like, I'm gonna do the best that I can my way. None of that from Peyton, there's nothing. The crowd immediately loves her though, of course, because she's the main character and they can sense that. Our character is just not very intelligent either. 
So she knew she was going to these interviews where people were going to be expected to show off their powers, and she has watched every single contestant show off their powers before her. But now that it's her turn, she's like shocked that she's expected to show off her powers, and she has done zero planning to figure out how that's going to go. Well, my days are not taking you seriously. They're certainly coming to a middle. She decides on doing some crowd work and takes a volunteer from the audience. So basically, we just watch um, Payden cold read a member of the audience. Everyone is shooketh and stunned because they just cannot imagine that anyone could do this without powers. She cold reads several people. Never gets it wrong. We never have to deal with her, like, the techniques that uh, people who are doing cold readings use to, like, minimize anything that they get incorrect. She gets everything right. That's the end of the chapter. She, the crowd cheers, everyone's excited for the Hunger Games, I mean purging trials, and she thinks, I'm no one's pawn. But that doesn't mean anything, because we just like, what, what, who is she? What does she want? Why is she here? The beginning of this book felt, feels so disjointed from where we are now, because the character we were setting up definitely does not seem like the person who's like going to be going into these trials. So yeah, um, that's all I have for that chapter. I'm going to go eat my lunch now and I will see all of you again for the next chapter. Nice short one this time. Hello, hello. We are back for another chapter of this book, which I think it's a slightly longer chapter, certainly longer than the last chapter, but, uh, we are with Kai again, and we all know how I feel about this man. We're back. We're back to torturing somebody. Oh, why are we supposed to be rooting for this ship? He, like, he has no remorse about it. He's just like, I was trained my whole life to torture people. At least feel bad. My guy, like, do the bare minimum. But I think we're supposed to think that he's a badass. He's a badass because he learned how to torture and how to be cruel while his brother learned to be kingly. And it's like, you realize that you can, like, fight against this, right? It's that whole thing where it's like, you know, if he had a good excuse for why he did the terrible things, then it's okay that he did the terrible things. And it's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. How do you deftly walk somewhere? It says, I deftly head to the throne room. That doesn't make any sense. Like you can def, it means skillful basically, right? How do you deftly walk to another room? He thinks about his interactions with Payton so far as toying with her. How, how, like, at this point, I am convinced that he is a psychopath and this is actually like a psychological thriller and Payden is in serious danger from this man. Ah. He's also been torturing people, once again wearing apparently business casual. Like, these guys don't know who, uh, that anything else exists as far as clothing for men. It's just button-down shirts and black pants all the way, baby. It's like in that one book that we read with the twins I can't remember the name of it, uh, something Academy. You know what one I'm talking about. Uh, all of the guys in there only ever wore white t-shirts that were like at least one to two sizes too small. Those are the only types of shirts that they knew about. These guys are the same way. So he goes to dinner all bloody. <laughs> Thank God, these people only have beans. Okay, this is gonna be my ongoing theme for this book is beans. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Some think it's our specially cured bacon. The theme of this book is beans, just like the pig challenge, because he goes to dinner and like, we don't find out anything that he's eaten except for, I finished the last of my beans. We don't know what kind of beans. Are they string beans? Are they kidney beans? Are they black beans? Are there no type of bean? A lot of people want to know what makes Bush's baked beans taste so darn good. All the people are at the table and, um, Payton sees him with blood on his shirt and she like looks concerned for a second and I'm like, oh honey, no, that blood is from torturing somebody. He's fine. Your psychopath boyfriend is fine. So the queen brings up that the big ball is coming up. We have to have a ball for everybody to dress in pretty clothes before they go kill each other. Obs. And she says that one of the traditions of this ball is you're supposed to pick a partner beforehand. You're supposed to find a date to go with beforehand. Awfully convenient, isn't it? If I was her and I had to choose from one of the two princes, I would choose the one who hasn't just come back from torturing somebody, but uh, for some reason she's not attracted to him. 
Now Kit is not actually going into the tournament, of course, but it's mentioned that he will definitely be participating in the ball. Of course, Kai is like, she'll never want me, but I like a challenge. It's like, dude, like it's, it's not slow burn. You're already just into each other as always happens in these books. And it's just a matter of like both of them being like, Ugh, no, I totally hate him. I don't know what you're talking about. I got feelings, so many feelings. We get a brief implication, we get a time jump, and we get a brief implication that Kai has nightmares, and it's like, oh, poor baby. Oh, oh, you poor thing. You know who else probably has nightmares? The families whose loved ones throats you slit in front of them. They probably have night. you poor, poor man. You know who's probably having nightmares right now is the person that you're torturing down in the dungeons. You're torturing him daily. Forgive me if I don't feel sorry for this psychopath. Also, apparently, like, it's so confusing, the rules of this place. Apparently they can just go around now because he goes out of his room and he encounters Peyton leaving her room because I guess she's just allowed to go places now? Like, where is she allowed to go in the palace? Is anything off limits or can she just wander? I feel like she could probably just wander. This king has taken absolutely no precautions to make sure that no one gets assassinated. Oh, okay. Small castle, I guess. So they literally walk for a few strides. That's all we get. They turn a corner and they're at the kitchen. But we do have more food. Biscuits and eggs. They can smell the biscuits and eggs cooking. Probably the chickens eat a lot of beans. Ooh, ew, 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 I hate this. I hate, I hate this so much. I do not understand why this is appealing. Like even in my fiction, I don't understand why it's appealing. I know that reading about fictional relationships that we would never ever want in real life is very appealing to some people, but I'm not one of those people. So he is dragging her to the kitchen and she doesn't want to go. And he says, I suppose my job will forever be feeding you now. Hmm, gray? Ew, 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 she can feed herself, dude. I just, I have a real problem with guys who tell women what food to put in their bodies. Like, such a big problem with it. Like, even if the guy thinks that he's being nice and good and, like, encouraging her to eat and everything, no, ew, disgusting. What someone else puts in their body, for the most part, for the most part, is none of your fucking business. Especially since you barely know her. Maybe if you were an established couple, you'd been together a long time, you know each other's habits. And maybe if one of you was having a really rough time and struggling to eat, maybe because of illness or mental illness, something's going on in your life, then yes, the other partner could be more forceful in encouraging the partner to eat. But that, that is not this. This is some guy who's just decided it's his job to be in charge of what this woman puts into her body. And it is disgusting to me. I don't know, some people clearly like this, but no thank you. Oh, we have bacon as well. What do they feed the pigs? Probably beans. But now we get to see that Kai has a rapport with the kitchen staff, which means that he's not a crazy psychopath who murders and tortures people. I just don't understand about how they view the plague in this world, how anybody views it. Because one minute it seems like it was a bad thing, and the next minute it seems like it was a good thing. Payden tells the cook, oh, you don't have to call me Miss Payden, just call me Payden. And it says, I practically see Gail relax, probably thanking the plague that formalities aren't needed. Do they worship the plague? Is the plague their god? Because that's what it seems like. But if they worship the plague, if the plague is their god, I want to see more of that. Like, how do they do that? They just have replaced god in their vernacular, in our vernacular. They've just replaced it with plague, or plagues, uh, plural, for some reason, sometimes. But, like, there's no infrastructure in world building to support it. More mention of sticky buns, sticky buns, and beans. The numbers one and two food consumed in this world. We get told that Gail, who is the cook, gladly informed Payden of some rather embarrassing stories from my childhood. But we don't hear the stories. We don't hear the banter. And like, yeah, this book is chonky enough as it is, but um, I have been seeing more and more authors avoid stuff like that. When we are trying to humanize this man, he desperately needs to be humanized because he is, as I've mentioned, an insane psychopath that we should stay far, far away from. Some stories about his childhood would not go amiss. 
And then we can see how he reacts to those stories being told. Does he laugh along? Does he get embarrassed? How does Peyton react? It could be a good moment. I still wouldn't ship them, but it might help other people ship them. He also thinks of the shirt that she is wearing as a tank. He knows what a tank top is and he abbreviates it to tank. Also, he's been doing a lot of that whole like, you know when the guy, when he's feeling possessive sometimes will like touch the small of your back to try and guide you along as a woman. And if it's from someone that you know and love, it's fine and it's a lovely gesture. But if it's from a stranger, it's creepy and please don't do it. Um, he's doing it and my stranger danger alarms are going off like crazy, especially with how controlling we have seen him be. And time skip. But they go to the training grounds and immediately it's shirt off for this boy. Why is your shirt off? Why is your shirt off? I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I can tell what the authors themselves are attracted to or what they like best. Like in the Silly Dragon book, it seems like the author really likes tongue kissing or at least finds tongue kissing to be hot. And in this book, I have a sneaky suspicion that this author really likes men with their shirts off. It is her preference. These sexy men, shirtless all the time. She doesn't want any like well-fitted shirts showing them off. Mm -mm -mm. No, get the clothing out of this arrangement. So this time in the training ring, because they've done the interviews, now everybody is training using their powers. And it's like, why weren't they training using their powers before? Most of them even know each other. Like what would it hurt? Especially since after the interview, then they're just gonna train using their powers. So why not, you know, get a head start? Oh, but already paid in his back beating up on a tree, I guess because she doesn't have a training partner. Oh no, who, whoever will go be her training partner, gosh. Also, Kai and Kit only ever fight each other, which does not prepare Kai for fighting anyone else. Like, yeah, he's gonna be really good at fighting with Kit, but we ne never, not yet anyway, and we've seen several training scenes. We have never seen him train with anybody except Kit. So we're having some back and forth with Kit and Kai, where we find out that Kit feels that his duties as future king are boring, and he's jealous that, that Kai gets to go into the arena, but I'm like, Kit, are you saying that you wish that you were the one murdering families and torturing people daily in the dungeon? Is that, like, does, how much does Kit know? Does Kit know that this is what his brother does or does he just think that Kai just leads a more exciting life than him? I also wish we got some inclination, any, any hints on whether Kit intends to be the same type of king as his father. I would love any kind of hint at that. I reluctantly stand to my feet, you know how I feel about stand to my feet, and lazily brush the dirt from my clothes. What clothes? I mean, your pants, but you, you're not wearing a shirt. He was laying on his back in the, in the sandy training pit and he's presumably covered in sweat. So now I can't help but imagine his entire back is just coated in sand and dirt. So he decides he's bored of fighting Kit at last and he looks over and oh hey, there's a girl I can bother because Payton's still over there endlessly punching a tree and he decides that that's his business. Oh good, he's violently angry too. I mean, I'm not surprised, but he wonders why she keeps punching the tree and then he says, I shake my head already knowing the answer because I've done it before. I've hit pads, walls, anything, anything? until blood dripped from my fists, all to find a release for the anger, the frustration that's pent up inside of me. Oh, good. Tell me you're going to be a, an abusive boyfriend without telling me you're gonna be an abusive boyfriend. So of course, because this is who, who Kai is as a person, he decides to correct her form by grabbing her hips without her permission. I desperately hope that she punches him in his stupid smug face. Once again, we have something that's supposed to have happened that we don't really see. I can see how much stronger she's gotten in her short time here with the constant meals and training, but because so little time with those constant meals and training has, has passed, it feels like, like two days have passed and he's already like, she's so much stronger. So like, there's no feeling of passage of time. And I know a lot of authors starting out and even authors who aren't starting out, I still struggle with it too. A uh, passage of time in your story can be a really difficult element to get a handle on. Oh good, she does punch him in the face. But uh, I, I went ahead just to see in his next chapter and he dodges, so damn it. Damn it, I really wanted him to be punched in his stupid smug face and then blood to go shooting everywhere and it would have been glorious. Uh, it's a pretty short chapter, maybe I'll read it and then I gotta go 
yeah, it's like three pages, eat some lunch. So I'll be right back with that or not. I don't know where this is gonna fall in the order of videos. Alrighty, short chapter, short chapter. Here we go, we're still with Kai and he doesn't get punched in his stupid face. He dodges, cause he's just so good. I hate in these books that they keep having badass women, but the women can never be so badass that they beat the love interest. The love interest always has to be better than them, no matter what. He keeps ducking her punches and I don't know why because of course these guys are always really tall and the girls are always really tiny and short. So why, like he's just duck really far. Just move your head back or out of the way, man. If they are going to spar, what should happen is she should win because he has not trained to fight her. She's gonna have moves that he has no like plan for, he's never experienced before. So she should at least have a decent shot of winning this sparring match but she won't. They're flirt fighting now, of course they are, and it's very cliched, like there's some real groaners of lines in here. Also a lot of smiling going on in this scene as well. So at first she's doing really well and I'm like, ooh, do I get my wish? Do I actually get my wish that he's like so unused to fighting somebody with her body type, her style, that he will lose? But no, he just wasn't trying. Uh, he's, he's about to try now. Once he's trying, he immediately bests her and like puts her on the ground. She does kick him in the balls though, so points for that. But double tap, honey, just keep hitting him. But he's still holding back because he doesn't really want to hurt her. So like any success that she has in this fight is now meaningless because he's holding back the entire time. He, any win that she has could be attributed to the fact that he's not actually fighting her as hard as she's fighting him. This is also the kind of description of a fight that is extremely meticulous and blow by blow. We are finding out like every single movement that they are making down to which hand is doing what thing. And personally, I don't need it to be so descriptive for a fight scene. I do like it to be descriptive, but this is a little bit over the top. And I feel like probably what happened is that the author literally went on YouTube and looked at a video of a fight and is writing down everything that happened in the fight, like two, two people sparring, and she's just writing it down, which I have done before, not to this level, not to this extent. I more like looked at the fight for like an overview of like, hey, how did that fight go? What were some moves that my characters could do? This description. With surprising speed, she grips the backs of my ankles with her hands. Well, what else would she grip your ankles with? And yanks with that strength of hers. Ah yes, that strength of hers. She's so famous for that strength of hers. What the fuck? Now she's straddling him. We knew this was gonna end with straddling. I just wasn't sure whom was gonna be straddling whomst. Ah, we have the infamous double straddle um, where he distracts her by flirting. She's very susceptible to the flirting and he then uses it to flip them. So now he's on top. She does finally headbutt him in the nose. So. Thank goodness for that. I have been begging this entire time for her to like, just fuck him up. It's a pity that this will not lead to him leaving her alone after this, but in fact, this will be interpreted as sexy. And I hate him. Did I make that clear yet? Oh, she does like the Black Widow thing where she like manages to like get up on his shoulders and squeeze his head between her thighs and then like use her momentum to throw them both to the ground. Women in those things always be killing people with their thighs. Oh my God, I would give anything if in this, right now, cause she said before she was like, I know you were going easy on me while we fought and I would give anything. If now that she is back on top, if she would be like, here's my secret, I was going easy on you too. They're flirting, she's like sitting on top of him again. She's, she's back straddling him now. But you know, they leave with all of the sizzling sexual tension and as she's going away, he thinks vicious little thing indeed and I throw up in my mouth. You know, this book is ruining flirt fighting for me. Honestly, all of these books have been like in, in the book that I'm drafting right now, the main character is in the army. She's in fantasy army and there may be some hand to hand combat involved. Obviously I'm not gonna be doing it like fourth wing where it's just sort of all hand to hand combat and hand to hand combat and obstacle courses and nothing else. We're not doing that in my book. There's gonna be a lot of different types of combat that they're gonna be learning. There's a lot of drills that they're gonna be running that makes sense for what they'll be doing as an army. But I would perhaps 
like to have the lead character spar in a flirtatious way with her love interest. Except for now I feel like I can't do that because all of these books have ruined it by making it so ridiculously cliche. I'm gonna have to try to find a way to like do it but not follow the exact guidebook of what this book did. Ugh, I hate it. I hate it so much and I hate him so much. Um, I'm starting a new campaign. It's just called Fuck You Kai. Uh, that's it. That's the whole thing. All right. That's enough reading for me today. I've got other things to do. I'll catch you next time. Sorry to crush your hopes and dreams, strong bad. You know who doesn't crush my hopes and dreams? My patrons, in reverse order just for fun. Sarah, Lisa, Amanda, Jenny, Savvy, Scribbling Cat, Rennie, Jesper, Zaire, Shelby, Callison, Anne Sophie, Patrick, Belle, Light Julie, Kit, Merween, Sophia, Swamp Goblin Waifu, Melissa, Afra, Deborah, Alyssa, Celia, Amanda Lafone, KJ, Jessica, Caitlin, Ursula, Robin, Jojo Bookish, Bear, Kirsten, Putamancer, Mooney, Kohikaro, Kira, Sam, Haley, Pantsing Pony, Roma, 78 Kilograms of Shade, Cat, Sarah, Peregrine Morningstar, Sunny Shy, Bird Anonymous, July, Martha Baggins, SB Boots, Lak Nunga, Constantina, Gay Tutter, Jen, Annika, K, Scout, and GK. Thanks so much for not ruining my hopes and dreams, everyone.